This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Paul Sweeney, along with Tom Keen. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show. Weekday mornings from 7 to 10 Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business app. I don't know what's happening here. This economy looks darn, darn strong. We got some data last week, particularly on the jobs front, that just shows you how strong the economy is. And it just kind of getting people increasingly saying, maybe this Federal Reserve does not have to rush uh, too much. Let's check in with somebody who, who knows this stuff uh, better than we do. Jennifer Lee, a Senior Economist and Managing Director at BMO Capital Markets. Hey, Jennifer, we got some really strong economic data last week. I mean, that jobs report just kind of blew out expectations. And then we have the Fed chair last night before the Grammys on 60 Minutes saying, eh, we're no rush to really cut rates here. What do you think the Fed is kind of doing here is to digest a lot of this economic data we've been getting? Uh, well, good morning, and thanks for having me on. I got to tell you, it's like just a few minutes after that number came out on Friday, my first thought was, are we even talking about rate cuts anymore? I mean, do we even need right. to? <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not the only one that was thinking that way, because I thought, what am I missing? Um, but I think it's it's the whole, you know, the, the those keywords of being patient. And what, what was that word that he kept using over and over again after uh, during his press conference was being confident and being confident that inflation is coming down to 2%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He needs, they need a lot more confidence that, um, you know, that, that inflation, again, is coming back down to target before they actually start to raise rates and, of course, or start to cut rates. And, of course, this kind of number throws, I think, everyone off, you know, um, off completely. So you have to sort of, you know, rejig it a little bit, rejig the communications a little bit, but sort of keep the story on path about rate cuts coming, but just not sooner rather than uh uh, but not, uh, but later, of course, not rather than sooner. Yeah, Jennifer, recalibrating those rate cut expectations. When do you think uh, the Fed starts to pull the trigger? I'm just looking at the warp function WIRP on the terminal, pricing in right now, June, then July and September. What What are you making of that? Yes, that sounds good to me. <laughs> so we haven't, you know, we, we were we, again, we were debating this on on Friday as well, but we're going to stick to our um, July rate cut for the for the first move. Um, you know, we had always, you know, wondered what we were missing, what, why the market was thinking about March. But, uh, um, you know, I'm glad, I'm actually quite glad that uh, Fed Chair Powell sort of put all those uh, concerns to rest uh, by, by dismissing March um, last week. But uh, we're going to stick with our July rate cut to be the, the, the first move and then four moves in total during the year. So 100 basis points in total for 2024. Hey, Jennifer, you look around the world and it seems like the U.S. economy is kind of the exception here rather than a rule. We've got continued uh, weakness in Europe, even including the, you know, obviously the mo most important economy over there being Germany. China, uh, just well below expectations. Does it surprise you that maybe the U.S. is doing as well as it is, given that its main trading partners aren't? Um, a little bit. I'm going to say, I'm going to admit that a, a little bit. Uh, makes me a little bit concerned at the same time, you know, I'm... <laughs> Some, again, I'm just always wondering, you know, what's what's going to come down uh, next that's going to throw everybody off. Um, but, you know, it gives support to the IMF last week and the OECD this morning, you know, raising their gro global growth forecasts uh, for this year and um, uh, sort of steady for 2025 on the back of a strong, resilient U.S. economy. Remarkably resilient, I think, was what the IMF called it. And meantime, you know, it's and it stands in stark contrast with what we're seeing in China with, you know, roughly four and a half percent growth this year. And Europe, which I think is just barely uh, just struggling to even grow, you know, we're looking for about a half percentage point increase this year. And that also shows up when you're looking at the different central banks. You've got the Fed who's still, again, talking about rate, rate cuts, but being but sort of pushing it off the, 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 the start date uh, further off into the distance. You've got the ECB debating, you know, whether or not they're probably going to go in June, by the way. Um, and then, of course, the Bank of England, who just ditch their tightening bias and Governor Bailey said that point blank and now they're talking about when rates are going to come down so it's very much different uh, discussions taking place around the world among central banks. Yeah, Jennifer, Ben Emmons just told us basically kind of reiterating Jay Powell's point that the bigger concern, biggest concern if you will is geopolitical risk. How are you taking that into account just given the continuing wars going on uh, across the pond? That is Probably one of those, you know, those big sources of uncertainty that, you know, that 
all the data in the world are not going to be able to predict. You know, you've got um, not only just like the, the actual war itself, but of course, the economic impact in terms of inflationary impact, you know, it may not be what we saw back, you know, in terms of supply chain issues that what we saw back in the during the pandemic, but it's still having an impact, especially with you know, um, very few ships going through um, the Red Sea nowadays and, and going across, going around Africa instead to get from like Europe to China or around or the other way around. So that's adding another 10 days. Um, last time I checked, you know, they're, all the ships are all using oil as well. So it's all, it's not an EV. It's not, you know, they're not using battery uh, batteries to run their ships. So this is all potentially inflationary, not as much as what we saw back in 2020, of course, but this adds a lot of pressure, I think, on what central banks are watching. Again, not only just the war themselves, but the economic impact. Jennifer, I've seen the US dollar kind of rallying here a little bit in the last several weeks. I guess expectations that maybe the Fed won't be as aggressive as maybe we originally thought in cutting rates here. How do you think about the currency markets and the dollar here? So the currency market has been like the one the one of the most toughest things to call over the past few years. It's it's been always at least the last few years has been very much of a strong US dollar story. Now this year we are still looking for the US dollar to weaken somewhat just, you know, in theory when you have the Fed starting to cut rates that should take some of the wind out of the US dollar's sails, but you know, I think and I said this before, I think it's all about perception. If all the economies around the world are slowing, but the U.S. is slowing the least or at the slowest pace, if you know what I mean, you know, I think that would actually give support to the U.S. dollar. So even though it's going to, you know, we look for the greenback to weaken somewhat, I don't think it's going to be weakening as much as we had originally anticipated, say, half a year ago. With payrolls out of the way, with, uh, as Paul pointed out, uh, Jay Powell kind of kicking off a Grammys <laughs> night, uh, what's next? What is on, what are you looking forward to? What do you have um, in the days, weeks ahead that can really drive this market? I think it's going to, I mean, I, I sound like a broken record, but it's all going to be coming back down to the data. All the key, all the key numbers. We can't only just look at just like with payrolls. You know, you can't just look at this one report um, on its own. But it's for the inflation data for sure. We're looking at CPI and even producer prices, just as an indicator of prices coming down, coming um, through the pipeline, and certainly the, the the PC deflators and of course consumer spending. The all important consumer spending numbers. Again, not just retail sales, but the all-inclusive PC report, just to see how broader spending patterns are. You know, I think overall, you know, as long as you have strong jobs, you're still going to see solid fundamentals below the U.S. Uh, consumer. You know, they don't have to spend spend all their all their hard-earned savings savings right away, um, but at the same time, it, it gives them support that it puts them away for a rainy day, and that will help them. You know, um, uh, that will actually help support the U.S. economy going forward, as opposed to you know just having everything spent all in one quarter. All right, Jennifer, thank you very much. As always, Jennifer Lee, she's a senior economist, managing director at BMO Capital Markets, located up there in Toronto. Nobody better to talk geopolitics than Mick Mulroy. He's a co-founder of the Lobo Institute. The Lobo Institute consults, advises, and teaches on current and future conflicts. His resume is just extraordinary here. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East at the U.S. Department of Defense. Former Paramilitary Operations Officer at CIA. I've heard of them. And a former U.S. Marine Infantry Officer for like, I don't know, 26 years. So we thank him very much uh, for his military service. Mick Mulroy joins us. Hey, Mick, it's heating up perhaps. Uh, I think the risk for a lot of folks here as we think about the Middle East is, it seems like the scope here might be expanding. Where are we right now and what are the risks, do you think, in that part of the world? Great to be with you guys. And I just returned from uh, from Israel, oh. uh, where I was in a lot of discussions on these things, these topics. And of course, Secretary Blinken is in the region right now, and he's going to be pushing on several things. Of course, uh, specifically to the war in Gaza, uh, he's going to be talking about the need to transition to a lower intensity uh, uh, combative uh, situation. Uh, and of course, Israel still has their strategic aim to de militarily defeat uh, Hamas, but that is not going to be done anytime soon. He's going to be talking about the need for increased humanitarian aid. And then to the point of your question, this is a conflict that has already expanded across the region with the Houthis' uh, attacks in the Red Sea, uh, in the Gulf of Aden, and the near continuous attacks on our forces in Syria and Iraq that might continue and might have to be even more of a substantial response than we've seen so far. So there is, and then Lastly, I'd say when it comes to expansion, there's always the concern of Hezbollah in Lebanon and expanding that to include two-front war in Israel. 
So this is something that is, uh, it's a tinderbox. I would argue that it's already happening. Uh, the, the question is whether we can prevent this from becoming a war that's directly between the United States and Iran. And that's uh, to be determined, I would say. Yeah, what can and should be done in your view to prevent that from happening? So there's a fine balance uh, when it comes to our responses to these attacks, for example, both against uh, commercial shipping uh, and our and our and our very uh, uh, naval forces that are there, and then uh, these continuous attacks against our positions in Iraq and Syria. I think the administration has now decided that they have to be more forceful because they're obviously not reaching the level of deterrence uh, that they wanted, and those attacks are now going after. Uh, I think IRGC positions, that's the Iranian Special Operation Forces that works with the proxy forces in Syria and Iraq, but it might eventually include targets in Iran. And I think uh, the non-answer from uh, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan recently on the television when he was asked that question is means to me that they are looking at that in the future if they cannot do uh, deterrence any other way. In terms of deterrence, Mick, you you know better than anybody kind of the assets the U.S. has in that part of the world. Do we have the assets and the capabilities to really uh, deal a serious blow to the Houthis and and try to get some control back in that part of the world, whether it's the Red Sea and other parts? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have not only the assets that we've uh, pushed to the region, but we have considerable assets, for example, in El Odeid, in Qatar, in Bahrain with our fifth fleet of uh, Central Command. Uh, and we, of course, have the ability to project power uh, better than any country uh, in the world, and perhaps in history. So we can, we have the assets, and we can certainly surge uh, to get more assets there. The question is, what is the balance between responding forcefully enough to get Iran to change its calculation when it comes to their support for proxies, and yes, they have different levels of controls of each of these proxy forces, but ultimately they keep providing the very weapons uh, that are being launched at our troops. So I think the indicator uh, of whether we have reached deterrence is if that stops. And I also would say that if, they, if it continues, that means they intend these weapons to be used against our forces, which to me means they're complicit in these attacks. And Mick, we were talking to one of our DC editors a minute ago about some of the aids and hurdles that are going on uh, on Capitol Hill. How does that impact what's going on with Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, and China? So they are tying, of course, as you know, a lot of these uh, security assistance packages together. So Ukraine uh, absolutely need to continue to support Ukraine. They are they are decimating. Uh, one of our most significant adversaries in Russia, right? So uh, that is something that I think is clearly in the United States' interest. It isn't charity. Uh, obviously, we should also support partners because that's what good partners do, but this is also in our interest. And that shows, uh, like Taiwan uh, and China, that we are a good partner and, and we stick with uh, our partners. So I think it, how we act with Ukraine will have an effect on China and the Taiwan situation. And of course, the aid specifically for the Middle East, it's both for Israel, and at last I read, is there like a $10 billion earmark for Gaza when it comes to humanitarian aid? And I would assume that it would also be for reconstruction after the end of combat operations. All of those things are incredibly important, uh, both to support a partner in Israel, but also to really recognize the level of a human crisis that's going on in Gaza right now. There needs to be much more uh, humanitarian aid going in there, and it's going to be needed for the foreseeable future. But there also needs to be a reconstruction effort as uh, Gaza itself has been essentially decimated. Hey, Mick, I'm probably like a lot of people in that this the, the news flow coming out of the Middle East has kind of pushed Ukraine on the back burner a little bit. Can you give us an updated assessment from you know your sources about how this thing can play out here? I mean, do, are we gearing up for another spring offensive? Are we back into that narrative? Is there any sense that there can be some movement? It's been such a long time now. Right. So we are at somewhat of an impasse, somewhat of a, a stalemate, if you will. But it's important to point out a stalemate doesn't mean that the fighting hasn't uh, subsided. There is considerable fighting going on, and Russia is losing a lot of soldiers and equipment every day. Uh, I think what uh, Putin is looking at right now, President Putin's looking at our level of support and what, if anything, would change if they're in, in the presidential election. 
That is what he's hoping on, that we cut our aid. Uh, obviously, the European Union, our European allies have stepped up and need to continue to step up, but the United States also needs to match that. It's very imperative that I think the Ukrainians get these significant weapon systems like the F-16 a fighter jet, like long range uh, artillery, the attackums, that is really what's needed for them to have an effect, be able to go and continue on this counteroffensive and take back terrain. If they don't have that, it's essentially going to continue in the stalemate. It's going to be a tick for tack for a long time, which of course we don't want. We want them to start making gains. Uh, we want to help them start making gains. So they push Putin into a corner where he is looking for an exit ramp. Right now, he's waiting to see what we do. Hmm. Yep. All right. Very good, Mick. Thanks so much for joining us. Always appreciate getting uh, the benefit of your wisdom and experience. Mick Mulroy, he's a co-founder of the Lobo Institute, uh, a career full of international expo um, uh, experience here on geopolitics. And boy, there's a lot to talk about. Right now, let's go to Laurie Cavasina. Laurie Cavasina, she's head of U.S. Equity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets, Royal Bank of Canada. But we've got the Canadian banks covered today. Um, hey, Laurie, thanks so much for joining us here. You know, I'd love to get your perspective on the market snapshot right here. We had a really strong November and December for risk asset stocks, bonds ripping. Uh, a decent January. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest. Do I just keep riding this thing? Do I just keep riding the big names that have worked for me? What do I do here? Hi, so thanks for having me. Um, look, I think it to some extent depends on your time horizon and your risk profile. I think the big move in November, December was absolutely deserved. We baked in a lot of good news on 2024, including the idea that the Fed is going to start cutting. Um, I think that January, we saw, you know, sort of the markets do well for interesting reasons. We saw the bond yield move back up if you look at the 10 year and that really supported the growth side of the trade, which is the bigger, you know, market cap weight in the index. Um, so it kind of brought an end to the broadening out that had gotten people excited in November and December, but we went up for slightly different reasons. Um, and I don't actually think that earnings has given us too much of a reason to go up. Nevertheless, the market has kind of muddled through. I think where we sit today is sentiments at a, a particularly sort of stretched point. Um, that being said, my work does suggest that valuation should be supportive at the end of the year, that as inflation continues to moderate, if we get better economic data in the back half of the year and interest rates come down just a little bit, we can support a pretty robust PE multiple in the market. So I think we may have to ride out some volatility. I think we're going to pay the price for all that, you know, big move that we had in November through January. But I think you wouldn't want to buy that dip. So again, are you going to try to play for every little tactical turn? Or are you just going to kind of, you know, ignore the noise? Most people I talk to are probably in the latter camp. And lawyer, when you're looking at buying the dip, is that on individual stocks? Or are we looking at buying, you know, the cues if we see the NASDAQ come under some pressure? So, you know, I've given edge to small caps and value on the year. And I do think that the the magnificent seven, I guess now we're talking about the top five, you know, I think they've outperformed for very good reasons. That being said, I think valuations are highly stretched. If you look at the top 10 names in the S&P 500, we're sitting at peak valuation. If you look at positioning, crowding on the CFTC data, if you basically just look at what is owned in the NASDAQ futures in terms of buy side positioning, we've actually broken above 2013, 2015 highs. So I think we look quite stretched. Um, and I think you look at things like small caps where the valuations are about average. Um, you've got position at three year highs, but nowhere close to all time highs. I think you've got a lot more room there to run. I do think for that part of the market and this broadening out to really work, you've got to see economic expectations improve. So far, we're only seeing people really inch up 1Q numbers. We're not really seeing a broader improvement in 2024 numbers as a whole. And you really need the latter to get that broadening trade to work. I'm in the camp. It probably can simply because I think uh, economic expectations have been consistently too low and I think we're in kind of a post-crisis PTSD in the economics community. <laughs> so Lori, when you screen this market here, are there any sectors that kind of jump out at you as either really attractive on a momentum basis, a value basis, kind of what are you talking to your clients about these days? So I think sectors are really tough. Um, I think that you're more looking at opportunities and in individual names and industries within sectors. That being said, I'm a strategist, so it's my job to pick <laughs> sectors. Um, I still think financials look really interesting here. And the, and the reality is, is that the market is not going to broaden out unless the financials participate. But I think you've got good valuations. You've actually started to see improving earnings revision trends. Um, and this is also a sector that does well when the animal spirits are coming back in the economy. Um, I would also point people to things like utility 
utilities and healthcare, if we're really going to have sort of a shorter term pullback in the market, I think you've got pretty reasonable valuations there. Um, and I also like energy as a hedge in my portfolio. It's a sector that really, you know, is a beneficiary of ramping inflation and ramping interest rates. We think those things are going to reverse this year. But if there's a risk that we're wrong, we love the valuations there. And just kind of putting all macro aside, we love the dividend yields. We think there's a lot more discipline in that part of the market. And so there's a lot more interesting stuff at the stock level if you can kind of get away from some of the big macro trades. Well, looking at you're mentioning, you know, financials and energy, uh, different kind of drivers there, right? One of the things we were talking about was the exposure to China and how China uh, kind of revamp could drive the likes of energy and some other parts of the market. How do you think about uh, deploying capital here in the U.S. with some of those geopolitical un- concerns and uncertainty still at hand? So I would say whenever China comes up as a big risk factor, it feels like tech is the first area people look at in terms <laughs> of uh, having some exposure in the risk. And and a second one, frankly, is materials. And that's because if you run screens of companies with high exposure to China, there aren't a ton of, you know, not every company discloses all their country level revenue, uh, but we see we tend to see those sectors pop up quite a bit. So I would say those are two areas to think about. I think consumer staples is another one that you can think about. We often, you know, see greater disclosure on the geographical revenue in that space as well. Um, we're about 230 companies out of the S&P 500 have, have reported here. Any any kind of themes you see here, Lori, so far? Sure. So we read a lot of transcripts on my team. Um, we've been <laughs> writing up, you know, sort of what we what we we think is going on, you know, at the end of each week and we'll piece it all together at the end. Um, But I would say the most interesting thing I've seen is number one, commentary around the Fed generally seems to be emphasizing the positives associated with the Fed's pivot in the fall or, or, you know, the fourth quarter or the benefits of just having greater certainty in the monetary policy outlook. So that's one thing that's jumped out. The second thing that's jumped out is that all the macro backdrop outlook discussions, there are kind of two camps. There are the people who are tilting positive and the people who are tilting negative. I was kind of surprised one company last week, actually. I mean, they just kind of went down the deep rabbit hole of all the risks we've got out there and used the word dismal uh, to describe the whole thing. And that seemed a little extreme to me. I think things are a little bit more balanced. Uh, But I'll tell you, at the beginning of last week, I was sort of struck by the fact that clients I was talking to seemed a little bit more in doubt on the soft landing thesis. And that's been a shift from what I've observed in recent months where it felt like the soft landing crowd was really growing. And I just sort of looked at all these comments that were coming in from the companies and saying, well, the fact that corporate America is not exactly on the same page and you're just getting such a murky, muddled uh, outlook discussion, I felt like that was starting to take a toll um, on investors themselves. And of course, we got just a a rash of positive economic data mid to late week. So we'll see what my conversations are like this week. Um, But I do think it's had an impact, to be honest. Yeah, no, Lori, just crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now is a headline, Snap plans to cut global headcount by about 10%. And it seems like we've had, you know, more than a handful of these announcements over the last several weeks. And it kind of reminds me of this exact time last year when we had some of these big tech companies announcing layoffs. And then at the end of the day, the job market was just as strong as it's ever been. So when you see a headline like Snap cutting global headcount by 10%, plus all the other headlines we've seen over the last several weeks. How do you kind of put that into context? It's a great question. Um, we did. We spend a lot of time looking at the challenger data, and I'll, I'll just give you the disclaimer. I'm not an economist, um, <laughs> so don't hold my feet to the fire. But you know what? We, we, we've kind of stumbled on something last year, which is that if you looked at the industrial sector, the layoffs were pretty minimal. And we think that was because back in COVID in 2020, they did GFC style, you know, or sized layoffs, similar kinds of layoffs to what they did back in the tech bubble, just really some of the most extreme periods of layoffs that have happened in industrials, the COVID layoffs match that. But then you look at financials, you look at technology, these sectors where they sent everyone to work from home during the pandemic, they didn't really do that many layoffs. And so we think whether we were looking last year in the first quarter at all the tech layoffs, or if we're looking at the tech and financial layoffs that have been going on you know, so far this year, it's really because there wasn't a lot of cleanup in those industries that happened during the COVID period. So there's kind of a, a pent up need to restructure and right size the businesses. I am watching what's going on with industrials really closely. We're not seeing a major breakout in those layoffs yet, but we do want to keep an eye on that because we have had a few companies come out and talk about that. For now, the challenger data is telling me to kind of ignore the news headlines a little bit, that it's still fairly concentrated in these sectors that had some overdue cleanup. Um, but again, we do have to watch, you know, just make sure that's not broadening out. Yeah, no, you mentioned 
the potential for overdue cleanup. One of the things that had come up on a call with an investor a few weeks ago was he basically said, in his view, these job cuts are a way of expanding uh, margins. So that's one yep. thing to keep an eye on. All right, Lori, thanks so much for joining us. Lori Calvacina, she is head of equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. All right, today's front page headlines. Elise Mateo, what stories do you have for yeah. us here this morning? Sure, we're starting with the Financial Times. It says Iran using two of the UK's biggest banks to evade sanctions. Now, this is documents that the Financial Times saw. It says Lloyd's and Santander UK, it provided accounts to, Bridget, to British front companies secretly owned by a sanctioned Iranian petrochemicals company. That was actually based near Buckingham Palace. Now, let me break it down for you. It's Petrochemical Commercial Company. And that was part of a network that the U.S. accuses of raising hundreds of millions of dollars for part of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corp. And also working with, with Russian intelligence agencies to raise money for Iranian proxy militias. This is a lot to take in, but the petrochemicals company, it's British subsidiary. They've been under U.S. sanctions since November of 2018. That's what they're looking at. So these documents showing that since then, this company has used companies in the U.K. to receive funds from Iranian front end in China while hiding their real ownership through, quote, trustee agreements. It gets a little confusing, but the main gist of this is it's all coming because you have the Royal Air Force. They're joining the U.S. airstrikes against Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in Yemen. So it's a lot to take in as this right now is going on. I mean, these are real banks, real yeah. names. I mean, you know, Lloyd's Banking Group, Santander, Santander the big, yeah. I mean, these are major institutions here. So they're supposed to be complying with these sanctions, correct? Correct, but that's, they were supposed to be since 2018, but now they're saying, well, that might not have happened. That and way. they're saying basically we can't comment on individual Correct. accounts, right? Okay, Correct. all right, Correct. well, very good. Uh, what's next? All right, so we're going to the Wall Street Journal. They're talking about Spotify accounts. This I didn't know. So if you have a shared music account login because you don't want to dish out the extra cash for the premium accounts, um, it's causing a lot of family battles because when you play your music, let's say I'm listening to some soothing, you know, whatever music, and all of a sudden Metallica starts blasting, <laughs> you know, it switches things over. It's because someone on your shared account change the music do you have spotify i don't have spotify i have i have the free account so i so i can't relate well, to i'm this. gonna go to bailey on this it, one he's, bailey, he's yeah. the demo here what I do you got for too us? much money on it i you pay do. for the apple family plan because okay. so with spotify my understanding is if my dad plays metallica metallica comes from my phone with apple if we yeah. share an account and i'm listening to say zach bryan okay and my dad starts playing metallica my music stops playing. So yeah. after going back and forth and I'm paying for it, I was kind of like, hey dad, you've covered a lot of things. I got the family plan, just make sure you use it. Cause it's 15 bucks a month, so it's not 9.99. It? Yeah. So, all right, so you have oh. Apple. I have Apple, I'm Apple And so through. if if one, if a feed is playing for one person, you as the second person don't get your feed? You get nothing. So you get nothing. If we're both. So there's only one feed at a time. It can't be simultaneous feeds going to all the family members. So I'd be on a walk. Well, with a family plan, you're playing, paying for separate accounts. So Correct. it's slightly Correct. different. Okay. But if right. we're sharing my individual you're account. You're sharing an individual account. And account. I am yes. listening to music on a walk and my dad presses play, he overrides me. And if I press play, I override him. Well, that's probably the way Apple and Spotify <laughs> want it because they don't want you sharing. Right, they want you to pay for the big exactly. family plan. <laughs> you pay for the family plan. The dumb thing is, is that I pay for Apple Music and my fiance pays for Spotify because she likes their playlists. So we're supporting two companies spending <laughs> probably I don't want to know what the banker in you says, but I probably shouldn't be doing it. Well, yeah, well, I listen to free over the air radio since I <laughs> took 15 radio companies public back in the day, but, um, and maybe a little satellite serious XM kind of thing. That's yeah. it. But I, I'm not paying. I don't know. It's just causing problems because you have like yoga instructors who are doing a class and then all of a sudden their husband clicks in and their yoga class that, is, that like, is a great part of the story on, you know? that is a great part of the story know, was it malicious though that's my question how would you well she that's kicked, the other in question, the story yeah. in, the, in the wall street journal yeah. this yoga instructor kicked her husband off or her boyfriend <laughs> off you're done because anyway she like can't you have, and your dad yeah exactly <laughs> all right now yes. i am i stand for my five hour shift in radio yes five hours yes. Uh, you know breaking every union rule in the book um <laughs> And I think that's better, but I don't know. What do you think? What do you got? You got a story here from the Washington Post. And you're right. It is better because I always admired you for that. I was always yep. like, man, Paul is standing in the but I, as But when I was managing a business in Bloomberg, we had to pay. There's a period of time, maybe six, seven, eight, nine years ago, when all the rage was getting the stand-up desk. 
So right. everybody wanted yeah. to stand those. That's fine, yeah. but it cost me like two, three thousand dollars to my budget every time we had to install. And I'm like, and the, and the kids would do it for like a day or two, then go back to sitting. And then so, go back to sitting. So, anyway. but it is. It, it's the, and the research shows it. So this is from the Washington Post. It says people who spend most of their work time sitting were found to be at least sixteen percent more likely to die earlier oh than normal than those who don't sit as much. And so the sitters, their risk from dying cardiovascular disease, it was thirty four percent higher than non sitters. So you see the difference there. How can you help? Well, they say to add more leisure time, physical activity. So go home, maybe hop on the Peloton for it says fifteen to. 30 minutes a day that can help out all right uh standing tables like you were talking about taking a break every 30 minutes i know my watch tells me when i have to st when i'm back when i'm standing too much yeah i'll just, I'll just tell hey rich i gotta take a break buddy yeah <laughs> you can tell him take a break yeah. and it says take a break every 30 minutes paul oh, so there you yes. go okay See, it's it's we'll get into your contract. when tom king comes says. back that's we're gonna have to work that into the whole <laughs> Are you a stand or stand? I have a standing desk. I bounce back and forth. I do want one of the treadmills though. The treadmill. I have friends that who yes. with the big work from home, they have the treadmill. You have it go like a mile and a half an hour, so nothing too crazy, but you're getting steps in. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. You can also watch the show live on YouTube. Visit the Bloomberg Podcast channel on YouTube to see the show. Weekday mornings from seven to ten Eastern from our global headquarters in New York City. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.